Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good evening, and thank you again for joining us tonight from the comfort of your homes. And I know for tonight, for many, it feels very different than Christmas Eve's past. And I know that we've had all kinds of mixed emotions, especially this past week, but I just want to say quickly that tonight, I thank God because this is the most at peace I've been in the past couple weeks. And that's for a lot of reasons, I think. For one of those reasons is memories that get brought up around Christmas Eve. I know not all memories are good, but the ones that are, are blessings. As we remember family and loved ones who are maybe with the Lord now. Memories of spending Christmas Eve here in your church home. Seeing everybody smiling, walking in, all dressed up, taking pictures just right back there before and after service in front of our Christmas tree. But I think a lot of the peace that I'm feeling tonight is just from being in worship and communion with you and celebrating our Savior's birth and knowing that we have a church family who can encourage us, who can point us to the manger and say, there's our hope. There's our Savior. But let's face it, this year we are home for the holidays. How's that song go? Oh, there's no place like home for the holidays. Right? Or as Dorothy put it, she said, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. The problem is in 2020... It seems more like, let me out of my home. <laughs> let me out of my home. But I think we can all agree and say that it's a blessing to just have a home. And we say, thank you, God, for that. You know, the term home is simply defined as this. It's a place where one resides, a familiar setting, or a place of origin. Now, the question is, Where's our home? Where's your home? Maybe you consider home the place where you spent most of your years growing up and making memories. Maybe it's where you took your first steps or where you learned to drive your first car. Maybe it's where you went to high school, college perhaps, where you met your spouse. Maybe it's the place where you live now. Or maybe for some of you, home is more, than, is more of just a feeling of being around those whom you love most. You see, there's nothing like being home, especially home for the holidays. And I remember when I graduated high school, I was like most 18-year-olds. I couldn't wait to go to college. Living off, away from home, away from my parents, no rules, no curfews, no chores. And so off I went, <laughs> over 900 miles away to the University of Wyoming to play football. And I thought, man, can life get any better than this? Well, it wasn't until I made a trip home about four months later that I was a little surprised at just how excited I was to be back. I think I was even more surprised at how good it felt just to, to land at the airport and be back in my hometown. And then I think about pulling into the driveway of the house where I grew up, walking in the back door and just saying, I'm home. <laughs> Greeting my family members, having a home-cooked meal that night. Ooh, that chicken spaghetti was so good. <laughs> Sleeping in my own bed. There's just something about being home. Home gives us a feeling of comfort and peace. And being home for the holidays is where we are now. <laughs> You know, that's where Joseph and Mary had to be as well, and where they ended up, in Bethlehem. They had to go to their ancestral home, traveling from Nazareth up north and going to the little town of Bethlehem, the city of David, as it was called. 
You see, Joseph was one of the many multi-generational descendants of the great King David. And being in the line of David, Bethlehem was the destination. It was home. Except it wasn't exactly a holiday that they were going there for. It was more about a government registration, a census like the one that we had this year for taxing purposes. And God had arranged for the Roman emperor to issue a decree just to get this little family to the right town of Bethlehem for a baby to be born. You know, tonight of all nights for a pastor, you want to preach a really good sermon. But I can think of no better way to do that than to go back to the story that we just heard and to walk through it again with you. So that's what we're going to do. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, and we will begin at the first verse. And by the way, I echo what Seth said. Thank you to all the families and the the Kids Count Kids that participated in the readings. Uh, I know it brought a smile to my face, and I pray it did to yours as well, just seeing them again. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now there's a lot of Bible scholars out there that will tell you that because they were going to the town of David that Joseph maybe had some family, friends there who would have been uh, able to put them up for the night. The problem is, it tells us that there was no room. The other side of it is we think of the innkeeper as Seth mentioned in his story, a modern-day hotel, if you will. But with the census happening, again, there was no room for this family. And then Luke, he shifts our attention in verse 8 to a different set of people, to shepherds living out in the fields. And he writes in verse 8, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today will be, or this will be a sign to you. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I love these next two verses. Verse 13 says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to whom his favor rests. You know, sometimes it's hard to remember that God's favor rests upon us. As I've already mentioned, sometimes we feel like this life can get pretty dark with what we face. God wants us to remember the light that he's given us. Isaiah 9 again, verse 6 says, A child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. We will call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we can take great joy and hope in that. Finishing this chapter, Luke 2, this, this section of our story, we'll read from verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. 
as I think about Mary treasuring and pondering those things in her heart, I started to think about we live, I believe, in a culture that's all about what's next. The tendency is for us to move on to the next big thing instead of taking time to ponder and to wonder what just happened. And so on this Christmas Eve, we're invited into this defining experience of a young mother named Mary. We're invited to put the brakes on the hustle and bustle that the world tries to put on this season. And think about what happened in Bethlehem that night a little over 2,000 years ago. As scripture tells us that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. So what are these things that Mary treasured and pondered? Well, I think it had to have started with the angel Gabriel announcement to her that she would conceive a child by the Holy Spirit and have a son and name him Jesus, who would be the Son of God. Then to feel the unmistakable signs of life growing inside of her. Certainly she would have thought about, pondered, and reflected on Joseph's reaction to the news his own experience with an angel messenger, his acceptance of her in this miracle baby. She would have remembered the rough road to Bethlehem and the mounting frustrations as they got there and were turned away time and time again until a stable was offered with farm animals as an option. Of course, then there was the pain of childbirth, only surpassed by the wonder of this baby boy. And she held that little baby that night. She pondered the promises the angels had made, and surely she ran through them again in her mind. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God, and the Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will be the king over the people of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. We can only wonder if she heard those words as she wrapped her little one in strips of cloths to keep him warm and secure. And I'm sure later on she pondered the abrupt arrival of the shepherds from the fields, breaking the stillness of that night. No doubt she would have treasured the memory of their faces as they told her the story of the angel coming to them and saying, a great joy will come to all people. The Savior, who is Christ the Lord, was born for you today in the town of David. This is how you will know him. You will find a baby all wrapped up and lying in a manger. And you see, that was her baby, her baby boy that they were talking about. It was all happening just as the Lord had said. And it's no wonder that Mary was pondering these things. You know, as I mentioned before, this big event that we call Christmas, that we celebrate, is a very timely example of what's next versus what just happened. The fact is, we jam-pack our lives with stuff. Our homes are filled with possessions. Our calendars are filled with events. Our hearts and our minds are filled with needs. But how much of that filling is of God? Do we take the joy that God gives us in this baby, Emmanuel, meaning God with us, and do we, we remember it? Do we treasure it? Do we ponder it in the weeks and months ahead instead of moving on? I pray you do, because this Christmas Eve, in this story, there is good news and great joy for you, because God still does what he did that night in Bethlehem so many years ago. He breaks into our reality. The power of his message breaks into our lives like bricks going through a pane of glass. Jesus comes to you whether you're ready for him or not whether you're looking for him to, or not. And his arrival means good news and great joy for all of us because it reminds us that God's favor, that his faithfulness, that his goodness, that his promises of that when we have faith in Jesus, there's nothing in this world that can take us out. Because the reality is the shadow of the cross falls across the manger where that baby lies. He will grow up to do what you and I could never do. That is live a perfect life. Exactly the way that God wants us to live. 
But then he does something unexpected with that life, that perfect life. He offers it as a sacrifice for us. He breaks into this world to lay down his life for you. The word incarnate, the word made flesh, enters into time and into this world in order to switch places with us, to be our substitute. Even though he knew no sin, he took on our sin and our death. And what do you and I get? We get faith and forgiveness and eternal life with him. He broke into our world not just to die, but to defeat death. You see, just as that ray of morning light fell across the manger that next morning, where the baby was laying, the Savior of the world, so does that ray of light burst forth from the grave, where our Savior rose from the grave three days after dying on the cross. He broke into our reality to change it, to give us the confidence that death no, is nothing more than a shadow that we must pass through, a doorway to the eternal life made possible by his resurrection. And tonight I pray that in hearing these words, the good news of our Savior that Jesus has broken into your reality right now, he wants you to know of his forgiveness. He wants you to know of the confidence of life with him that never ends. He wants to show you that the best way to live is by loving God and loving your neighbors as he's called us to. But first, what he wants us to know and wants you to believe is that he broke into this world to save you. And to make a connection with you. A connection that we call faith, which is a gift from God. A connection that gives you hope and a future. A connection that will never be broken. It's a connection he makes with us in our baptism. Where it says that we are buried with Christ, therefore that we may be resurrected with him and given new life connection he makes with us in his word when he offers us the forgiveness of our sins and tells us of his love for us. It's the connection he gives us that we will be receiving tonight in holy communion, receiving the very presence of our Lord and Savior, of that baby who we celebrate. This Christmas, the greatest gift that you will receive is that. It's Christ's presence in your life and the promise of his forgiveness. That is why he came. And he reminds us tonight that we have a forever home. What it really means to be home for the holidays is to be home with Jesus. You know, in John 14, Jesus paints this beautiful picture that gives me a lot of hope, and I pray it does to you tonight. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place that I'm going I am the way, the truth, and the life. And by believing that, you enter in to God's family. Through the waters of holy baptism, through the gift of faith that he gives you, and all made possible by the birth of our Savior. To be home for the holidays is to know that you have a Savior who has done everything on your behalf, who has broken into this world to give you the assurance and the peace that you have a forever home, a home with him and all the saints who are gone before us, who are celebrating this Christmas being in the very presence of Christ. And there's nothing better than that. And the best part is we don't even have to wait to be home with him because that starts right now in this life, in the birth that we celebrate, his presence is in our lives as we are reminded 
of the name that he was given, Emmanuel, God with us. I pray his presence surrounds you tonight, tomorrow as you celebrate, and the days ahead as you sit and you ponder all that Christ has done for us. And we say thank you, God, for the home that you have created for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.